So we're going to try to do this a little bit more as a tag team. Um, uh, we were challenged uh, to talk about enhancing functionality of each EHRs for genomic research, including e-phenotyping, integrating genomic data, transportable CDS, and privacy threats. It's not quite as long as Mark's, but all, all, almost, I think. So um, the first thing we wanted to talk about was the importance of uh, informatics for uh, an EHR for genomic medicine. And we thought one way to do that was to give examples of a couple of use cases. And uh, the use case that I'll talk about is, is eMERGE. Um, and a as we've talked about quite a bit already today, we think there's two really important elements to this. One is to show the value for discovery and actually to develop uh, new evidence that one might use going forward. Uh, in the case of eMERGE, we were trying to accelerate uh, gene and phenotype associations uh, by actually using electronic health records to do data mining, to develop electronic phenotyping algorithms, and then use those phenotyping algorithms to do genomic studies that would make new associations. And so I'll, I'll show you in a minute um, how we've gone about doing the uh, e-phenotyping piece of it, just one way. Uh, but the uh, next piece of that was to really demonstrate the portability of the phenotyping approach. And one of the things that goes without saying is across a merged network, not everybody has the same electronic health record system, and not only do we not all have the same electronic health record system, in those instances where we do have the same electronic health rest record system, they're really not carbon copies of each other, each electron, even each EPIC installation, and we have quite a few EPIC installations, are quite different from each other. So we had to develop this process of portability. And then the second broad piece of this, which is uh, another uh, role for electronic health records in genomic medicine, is this whole question of how do you integrate actionable genomic data into the EHR? How do you deal with the volume of genomic information that's potentially available? How do you use that to fire specific clinical decision support at the right time and yet not put the provider at risk of alert fatigue because they're getting the alerts every time something happens, even if it's not relevant in that particular case? And then how do we demonstrate that uh, this uh, kind of in integration is, is scalable? So our approach to phenotyping, just to talk about it uh, for, for a couple of minutes, uh, is to focus first of on the phenotype of interest and then in parallel develop a case and a control algorithm. And that case and control algorithm in the case of eMERGE, one of the first things that we learned was it's insufficient to just use a single data type. You can't just use a diagnosis code, for example. The only way the algorithms actually achieved any kind of robust uh, ability to identify cases and controls with uh, comparison to gold standard cases was through a combination of data types, including not only lab values and diagnosis codes and procedures, but actually quite often detailed uh, 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 processing of actual the language that's there put in text notes, and that turns out to be a fairly important area for us. Once you've got those algorithms, which were typically developed at a particular site using what was known at that site, uh, there was this manual review process to assess precision. And what we found frequently was that there was always a trade-off between the elements of that algorithm and how many, part how many cases or how many controls you were able to identify. And so there was a process to both increase the precision of it, but to do so in such a way that you didn't throw out all the cases that you might potentially have, and that became a, a real challenge. So after that pro internal process happened at a particular site, uh, then what would happen is we would iterate through that process until we hit a 95 percent positive predictive value at that first site. Uh, then the second process was to deploy it at a secondary site um, where the secondary site would uh, add in what happened when you used the, those elements at their site. Inevitably, one of the things that we learned was that that site, there, was, there were things that were in the algorithm that were either unique to the first site, which needed to be addressed, or other elements which could, could be improved. And then we went through the process of uh, validating it at multiple sites uh, and then ultimately did the genetic uh, association testing. So one of the things that was important in that process was to think about how could we actually share the phenotypes in a more computable way 
one of the pieces of work that was done in Emerge, uh, and I don't have the time to go into details, but was actually to develop a package that could be transmitted from one site to the next site, and basically almost installed that would provide the, at least the logic for the decision process using a NIME, a NIME workflow approach. The second big piece that uh, we wanted to talk about was the issue of uh, data um, integration back into the electronic health record. And this shows just one way of doing it. This is how uh, we're doing it at Northwestern. It's some similar version of this is being done at most cases, in most places. But um, the element begins with uh, a CLIA laboratory returning results through some kind of uh, secure data receiver. We've spent a lot of time focusing on how to get those lab values back, not as a text PDF, but actually as a computable uh, a triple store that could be put into the system. That goes into uh, something that we've been calling an ancillary genomic system. And the idea there is that if you had whole genome sequence, you're not going to want to dump the whole uh, genome sequence into the electronic health record, but rather only the things that are quote unquote actionable. And that brings into play the secondary component, which is, is this uh, actionable variant knowledge base. And, you know, many of us are excited about the prospects of ClinVar or ClinGen actually ultimately being that actionable knowledge base where you could then apply the uh, knowledge base against your ancillary genomic system through some kind of a knowledge engine and then put those variants and only those variants into the EPIC interface, which then can be delivered in a variety of ways through uh, to physicians through inbox, best practices alerts or lab results but also equally importantly to patients through their MyChart portal. One of the key elements of this kind of a system architecture is it addresses this problem that we've talked about several times today, which is the need to update as knowledge becomes uh, improved in the future. So you can imagine this ancillary genomic system and the um, actionable variant database constantly being updated and, and rerun through this knowledge engine to update the information based on current uh, best practices and current evidence, whether that uh, up, up, upgrades or downgrades uh, recommendation for a specific variant. So with there, I will turn over to Alexa, who will talk about the next use case. Um, so um, I'll, I'll be talking about the undiagnosed diseases network, which is actually a different kind of network from what I've been hearing uh, today of the, of the existing networks. That is to say, um, what we, we have a group of uh, seven clinical sites. Uh, and two sequencing centers who've come together uh, under one protocol that's run out of NIH. So this is a program that actually grew out of an NIH intramural program headed up by Bill Gall and others uh, in the clinical center um, and beyond. And so we have one protocol whereby uh, people will be, um, uh, will apply to uh, the undiagnosed diseases network if they are found to be scientifically interesting um, on a variety of different parameters, um, they would be accepted into the network, and then um, they would be assigned to one of the seven clinical sites to get a full one-week uh, workup, essentially. Um, what we've done, oh, did we just lose a slide? Um, what we've done is that we have um, uh, reached agreement with our, uh, with all of the collaborators on the kind of phenotyping that we're going to be doing, the deep phenotyping uh, that will then, of course, be co correlated with the genotype. Every, um, every uh, individual who comes into the system uh, will be, will have their data either, uh, will either be a whole exome or whole genome, and, and, and Howard talked about that a little bit uh, before. We, we haven't fully uh, decided how that will work. Um, but, and to the extent that there are family members, then family members will also have their, um, uh, their sequences, um, uh, will, will be sequenced. Um, so we have then uh, agreed on uh, using the human phenotype ontology to actually do rather deep phenotyping, and actually there's a star system involved there as well as to how deep you go into um, characterizing the individual. There will be more work done, and this relates to the EHR, there will be more work done that is captured within the electronic health record system, and we're having some discussions about how much of that, uh, that of those data will actually be part of the overall network. Uh, we've made a sort of a distinction between above the line data and below the line data. So what folks do at their clinical sites uh, versus, which is below the line, versus 
what data do they send above the line for use uh, across and within the network, but also for later sharing um, uh, with uh, broader uh, systems in de-identified form. Um, and uh, so there's a new version of Java that's available, which is outstanding, which is on my, oh, I see, it's on my screen, sorry. Um, okay, I'll kill it. Um, there's, uh, so we were going to be talking about uh, patients. So we do have a patient voice here. And actually, Rex, the story that you were telling um, before, uh, this is Matt Might, who is an individual who I consider to be a citizen scientist. He's actually a computer scientist who is, um, has uh, pushed very hard to understand what the problem is for his son and then has used uh, social media uh, to find additional cases and has been very successful, is very much of the social media uh, generation. In addition, we're going to be asking uh, individuals as they apply uh, to the gateway to actually phenotype themselves. So the patients are going to uh, be um, phenotyping themselves. They're going to be asked uh, a series of questions, and we're collaborating with Genome Connect on that as to uh, what, those, what that would look like and what that language would look like. And then there would be mapping from the, in fact, I think that's already happened. In fact, there's mapping from the Genome Connect terms to the human phenotype ontology, uh, which is uh, also an international um, effort. So uh, as far as, as uh, implementation, uh, there, we are expecting to have very broad sharing of the de-identified data. So written into um, the RFA was that any data that are generated as part of this uh, uh, project will, in de-identified form, be deposited in dbGaP. So that's, that's a definite, there's no argument about that. Uh, we'd like to go more broadly, and I think we have agreement uh, with all of our uh, collaborators that if we can uh, share our data with other public databases, Phenome Central, uh, the Canadian group, or other uh, groups. In fact, we're going to, some of us will be in Budapest uh, at the end of this month, uh, seeing whether we can share data more broadly with your, our European colleagues um, and beyond. Um, we have created some research tools. We've been collaborating with Mike Brudno um, in Canada on the research tools around uh, phenotyping um, and so forth. Probably our biggest barriers have been, uh, barriers in the sense that it's taken us time to get going, um, have been around the fact that we need a central IRB. So we, uh, in fact, all of these seven clinical sites, and some of those clinical sites actually uh, comprise several of their own clinical sites, uh, Harvard being a, a case in point, um, that we had to get everybody to agree uh, to uh, uh, follow the same rules there. And uh, we have a data sharing and use agreement uh, that's taken a little bit of time with a lot of back and forth with the various groups. Um, and importantly, uh, we are subject to FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act. Um, and this has had some impact, too, on how we're doing things. But in the end, I think it's going to put us in a much better position uh, with regards to those privacy issues, while at the same time we want to share as, as broadly as we can. So we're just getting started. We have not yet seen our first patient, although we're having uh, a soft launch, if you like, uh, of our system any day now. So we'll be having five patients from the seven, each, each, from each of the seven clinical sites. So we'll have data from 35 patients that we can then analyze, look at, and see uh, what we need to do to improve as we open it up more broadly. So that's, that's, um, and I think now I turn it over to Chris. I think we've been through a lot of uh, these organizations today and groups, so I'll, I'll do this relatively quickly, but uh, the whole notion of introducing sequence data into patient care is more than just the actionable variant. Uh, as we all know, the, the volume of data potentially is overwhelming for a lot of electronic health records, and taking raw sequence data, raw genomic data into the HR is probably not a clever idea. I, I think what most of these groups have concluded, and, I, and what uh, uh, Rex illustrated at Northwestern, is the creation of the, uh, what, the moral equivalent of a PACS system, a picture archiving system, as is used for imaging. Imaging data is typically kept outside of the electronic health record, and only the good parts, if you will, the reports or the snippets or whatever, are actually imported into the transactional system of the EHR. Uh, it's, it's clear that a, an, an analog of that is evolving in the genomic space. 
uh, where the raw sequence data is being placed in, a, in an offline repository or a, a near state repository. And that brings us to the second point of incorporating the actional variants. Uh, as we all know, the debates about what constitutes an actionable variant are, are, are rampant, uh, and we're, we're grateful for organizations like CPIC to help us sort that out. And we're also grateful for organizations within CPIC, like Bob Freimuth's work, trying to identify how do we actually render these actionable variants so that they can be recognized from a decision support point of view. It's not so difficult. Uh, from a research perspective to uh, characterize what an actionable variant looks like, uh, but it is a, a bear to turn that into something that the average clinical decision support system can treat as a single entity or a single uh, element uh, and be able to act upon. Uh, and the reason for that distinction is we know uh, that a lot of novel variants are usually dem represented as a grammar. Uh, of human genome variant system uh, characterizations or the like. Uh, and clinical decision support systems cannot deal with a grammatical expression. They can only deal with named entities and, and, dis and discrete entities. Uh, and in that context, okay. What, what do you mean by grammar? I, I'm, you lost me. Uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's at this location on the gene, and this is deleted, and that's inserted, and this is replaced with a that. You can express that kind of statement in a Human Genome Variant Society's grammar for characterizing uh, genomic variation. Uh, so you can unambiguously represent that data, and you can, you know, change the reference gene, and these things are interoperable, but they're not from, a from the perspective of a clinical decision support system, they're not uh, tags that a rule can readily fire upon. It's very hard to make a rule fire on some syntactic expression uh, of, of a genomic reality. And that's what we're dealing with uh, as we're actually, as the rubber is hitting the road in terms of, of clinical integration of this information into the systems. Uh, the whole notion of electronic phenotypes, as we've heard how Emerge has been doing that, and indeed many of us have been part of that, but it's important to distinguish what, what uh, has been characterized as deep phenotyping, uh, and particularly when we're in genomic variants. And the whole question of phenotype is a very slippery slope. We all know that phenotypes can exist from a molecular level, a cellular level, I mean any arbitrary level of physiologic organization up to society, I suppose. Um, and uh, to say that we have a phenotype at a patient level, in the context of eMERGE, it has been a very surface phenotype at the level of those variables that are readily available from an electronic medical record manifest as by things like drug use, a disease assertion, laboratory variation, and the like. That's just the veneer of what phenotype actually is. Uh, and while it's convenient and scalable and we've made a lot of progress with electronic phenotypes, we have to be more thoughtful as we move forward. And I'm going to skip ahead to the standards thing for just a second because it's important that we not get ourselves into the usual domain silos of how we characterize phenotype. Uh, we don't want the research community to do it one way and the clinical community to do it, to do the same darn thing a completely different way. Uh, these things ultimately have to be recognizable, scalable, um, uh, determinable from uh, equivalent sources. And then the whole process of implementation and sustainability, uh, uh, Ignite, I think, has been uh, really at the forefront of that in terms of, of process engineering and understanding common pathway and, and common activity. Next slide. Oh, we're there. Uh, so the whole notion of gaps and opportunities, uh, you know, go to Midas, you get a muffler, come to me, you get to talk about standards, and I'm, I'm happy to provide one. Uh, but the whole notion is that, you know, there are standards and there are standards. The old joke is that there are so many to choose from. And, and again, by analogy, uh, we, we, have, um, uh, we have actually NIH creating clinical data, data elements or data elements about clinical observations that, how do I say this politely, are completely disjoint with what is going on in the clinical information space. 
what is going on in the HL7 standards community, what is going on in other standards, who are, by the way, dealing with the same problems. HL7 is not totally unaware of genomic characterization and uh, the integration of genomic facets into medicine. And yet, to my knowledge, uh, we have the traditional, uh, you know, baronial divides of academic research communities going about uh, generating these kinds of things with, in many cases, a blank sheet of paper uh, and not effectively leveraging what is actually going on in the clinical space. Uh, so uh, the whole question of, of interoperability, uh, I, I think the advent of, of uh, APIs or application programmer interfaces into electronic records will be fundamentally transformative. Historically, the way data was stored within an electronic health record was the way data was stored in that particular health record. What's changed is now a customer expectation that they can write this API call and they'll get back what they expect. And it shouldn't matter whether it's Cerner under the cover or Epic under the cover or Northwestern Epic or Mayo Clinic Epic or, or Johns Hopkins Epic. You should be able to execute the API and get an expected thing back. This is new and different, uh, and this has really only been implemented in the past year or so in, on a prototype basis and has not really achieved a large-scale implementation. But the point is, as we establish standard interface methods into the electronic health records that will return predictable information reliably, that will transform the way we can actually query the record interact with the record and have decision support environments that actually uh, manage it. Uh, the whole sustainability problem, long-term access, uh, this starts to get at the fragmenting of patient data across different providers, uh, the fragmenting of uh, uh, information about them, uh, not just with healthcare providers, but frankly with, with ancillary sources with laboratory environments, with genomic testing environments, with other kinds of environments. So data integration, I think, is really the, the task that is really before us. And whether it's the patient that integrates that data, the research community that integrates that data, the provider community, accountable care organizations, these are political issues. But the, the task clearly remains uh, that we need a way to sustainably integrate uh, and defragment uh, information about patients if we truly want to make sense of it uh, in a scalable uh, way. And then finally, the whole notion of consent and metadata. Uh, I think as a community, and I have to count myself among the guilty, uh, we have not historically given enough thought to carrying sufficient metadata. And by that I mean, you know, where the data come from, the t typical provenance data, the who, what, when, where, and why. Um, and the, the consent information, the permission information that goes along with that as part of the payload with the data that we are actually managing and manipulated. We should never separate that metadata and especially the consenting information from the payload data. And we should learn to think about those as self-describing, self-contained data objects that we can manage and treat as objects so that we don't have to go searching for the consent information. It's part of the data. We don't have to go searching for uh, the, the provenance information. It's part of the data. There are circumstances where provenance should be protected. Uh, privacy, confidentiality, do you need to know that? No problem. It can be encrypted, but it should not be paired away. And so the principle of how much information do we actually carry along uh, with the payload data. Storage is no longer an issue. I mean, to complain that we have to store an extra 50 bytes of data is not going to cut it uh, in the 21st century, particularly when we're looking at, you know, gigabytes of information that it's actually characterizing and describing, just a tiny, tiny fraction. So the importance of metadata and carrying that information along, I don't, and especially consenting, cannot be underestimated. So with that, I return it to you, Rex. Oh, that's, that's all right. Um, okay. We skipped over the synergies, but that's fine. 
Um, so uh, w what we're talking about is what, what training opportunities, what, what is already out there with regards to some of the issues that we've been talking about, uh, the standards uh, and so forth. So there, there are some um, uh, training programs. The, the National Library of Medicine Informatics uh, Fellowship and Training Program certainly exists as a longstanding program. Uh, 14 uh, sites, uh, academic centers across the country have these grants. Um, there's uh, now uh, additional training for clinical, the clinical informatics subspecialty, which I think you're, many of you are aware of. That's, that's focused uh, pretty heavily on um, HIT issues and, and uh, electronic health record um, systems and so on. And then currently the BD2K training efforts. I guess what I would say about this is that these are not coordinated efforts, and so the question is, what's whether the appropriate kind of training for um, uh, for the informatics kinds of issues that we were discussing here um, is is there and whether there is a way to bring some of these programs together and to make sure that everybody is getting uh, the sort of the same foundational concepts um, as as they go forward and become uh, independent investigators uh, we absolutely have to improve the pipeline of of math and uh, computer science skills. And I think we were saying that the earlier we start on that, the better off we're going to be because uh, we have, for example, in my program, I, I train postdoctoral fellows. It's way too late to teach them math and to teach them quantitative skills. And yet we have to do it. We have to do it. And so uh, well, I think- uh, It's only Harvard. It's only Harvard, okay. All right, uh, point well taken. Okay, point taken, how about this? <laughs> okay, um, so then I thought we would move into the discussion questions and we put our heads together and we came up with a number of questions and um, I don't know if you can read them, but I'll read the first one. Um, and that is, uh, while individual projects might agree on data standards specific to their needs, how do we plan for and promote large scale data sharing across projects and beyond? And we have been talking about that here, but how, it, just to, to uh, address uh, Terry's concerns, what could, what could the Genome Institute do here so that we are actually sharing across projects? It's one thing for us to share within our networks and perhaps maybe to share with a couple of uh, public databases, but how can we do better at sharing across projects? So I guess I would ask our collaborators first on the panel whether they have something to say about that and then maybe open it up to the group. Rex? Let's hear what the group has to say. Okay. Is there, I'm actually not in a good position to. I, I think just for the sake of making the discussion move, if you can read the bullets, especially if those of you have in front. Should I read them all the way through? Let's just open it up to anything. Okay. I don't think we need to read them all. Everybody okay, fine. Can see if people can read them, then so. that's fine. Okay, great. 